Welcome everybody to Long Crime Daily. I'm Jesse Weber. The defense in the Alec Murdoch double murder trial has officially rested. On Monday, the jury heard from experts who dispute the state's position about how and possibly when Paul and Maggie Murdoch were shot and by how many gunmen. Long Crime's Ann Jeanette Levy explains from South Carolina. Uh, my opinion is the totality of the evidence is more suggestive of a two shooter scenario. Tim Palmbach is an expert in blood spatter and crime scene reconstruction. He said he believes the murder of Paul and Maggie Murdoch likely involved two shooters. Hey, why would one shooter bring two long rifles, two long weapons to the event? You can't handle and shoot two of them. The opinion goes against the state's theory that Alec Murdoch used two guns owned by his family to kill Paul and Maggie. Palmbach also said he agreed with another defense expert who said Paul Murdoch was shot in the head with the barrel of the gun touching his head from behind, not from the side and in an upward angle, as the prosecution claimed. Prosecutors questioned his conclusions. And you just got the chance to go out to Moselle, was it last Friday? That's correct. And so between last Friday and today, you've had the chance to determine all of these things you've testified about. No. Before I arrived here, everything else was predetermined and I had done all the work in the analysis. Meanwhile, Dr. Jonathan Eisenstadt opined on the method the Colleton County coroner used to estimate Maggie and Paul's time of death. The coroner said he did so by placing his fingers in their armpits. You're sticking it in an armpit which is exposed to the ambient temperature. So uh, that it's just not a valid method to try to make a determination of time of death. Just a guess. For its part, the prosecution claims to call at least five rebuttal witnesses in its case. For Law and Crime Daily, I'm Anjanette Levy in Walterboro, South Carolina. Well, let's talk a little about the defense for a second, because one of the final witnesses the defense called was John Marvin Murdoch. This is Alec Murdoch's brother, and he described not only the night of the murders and his brother's reaction, but also what he saw at Moselle when investigators were finished with the crime scene. And did you go to Moselle? I did, after I left Greenfield, yes sir. And do you remember who was there when you got to Moselle? I was the first one there. And what did you do? I just went to stay there until I knew Buster, Brooklyn, and Ellick were coming. Um, I suspected that other family members and partners, I, I, I knew others were coming, so I just kind of sat there just, you know, in, just in disbelief still. Did you eventually go down to the kennels? Um, I did. I did. Um, you know, once everyone got there, there was just, there was, you know, a fair amount of activity in the house with family and, and law partners, um, Alex's law partners, Randy's law partners. Um, you know, I felt like I needed to go down. I needed to see for myself what, what had gone on and just, you know, just kind of take it in. I mean, just maybe for some type of understanding. And, and was it cleaned up? Um, no, Jim, it was not cleaned up. Okay. Were there skull fragments? Yeah, so, you know, so, so, <laughs> Excuse me, oh, this could be really difficult. So I, I, I could easily see where Maggie had been. You know, I saw the night before where the sheets were, but and somebody had told me that who was who, and so I could see where Maggie had been, and it was grass, and you know, they had covered it up with dirt, so there really was nothing to see where Maggie was. Um, I walked over to the feed room, and. Y'all have heard the descriptions. Y'all saw it. I, I've never seen pictures, and I've told them before coming to this court that I was not going to see pictures. But y'all can imagine what I experienced. It had not been cleaned up. I saw blood. I saw brains. I saw pieces of skull. Or, and, and when I say brains, it, it could just be tissue. I, I don't know what I was seeing. It was just, it was terrible. Um, and for some reason, I thought it was my something that, that I needed to do for Paul to clean it up. Felt like it was the right thing to do. I felt like I owed him and I started cleaning. And I can promise you, no mother or father or aunt or uncle 
should ever have to see and do what I did that day. And talking about that scene, the defense team actually wants the jury to be able to see the property where Maggie and Paul were murdered. This is known as Moselle. It's around 40 minutes away from the Collington County Courthouse. The prosecution objected to this, saying that the property has changed a lot since June 7, 2021, but the judge actually agreed to the field trip. Defense attorney Dick Harpulian says his only concern about the trip is security. Literally dozens of people at Moselle last weekend trespassing to get selfies in front of the feed room. I mean, most distasteful um, kinds of things I've ever seen. Just want to ensure that the uh, security is not caught unawares about what, what a circus is going to be outside the property. And I, they might, they've got the authority to close off the road. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not telling them how to do their job, um, but I am suggesting these are things that we became aware of over the weekend. All right. We'll uh, arrange for a jury view with, the, uh, with law enforcement. All right, let's break it down. I'm joined now by my co-host, legal experts, defense attorney Brian Buckmeyer, former trial, trial attorney Terry Austin. Terry, it sounds like the jury's going to be able to visit Moselle. I just don't know what significance that's going to have. Is that going to help the defense? I don't think it's going to help. I think when a jury goes out to the crime scene, it's really real for them. And I think it helps the prosecution because they're going to be able to put themselves in the place and feel the whole horror of the situation. And I think counsel asked for that because he said he wanted them to understand distances. He wanted them to see the kennel and understand exactly what happened that night. But I think it's going to backfire at the end of the day. And I think the judge made the right decision First of all, defense counsel was saying he wanted the jury to decide whether they wanted to go. <laughs> yeah. The judge said, no, it's up to one of you. If you want to request it, I'll give it to you. Right. And he did. Well, well, focusing on the defense for a second, it seems, Brian, that the defense is creating this whole other storyline as to how the victims died. And that seems like a stronger argument than just saying the prosecution hasn't met their case, hasn't proved their burden. Jesse, I would say it depends. If the defense has a stronger factual argument based on all the evidence that comes in and a jury says, hey, I'm going to compare and contrast these two different stories and the defense seems better than the prosecution, yeah, that can be strong. But I think it takes away from the defense's strongest argument of saying probably both. One, it's not my burden to prove anything to you, but I can show you why the prosecution has failed. Two, in me proving why they failed, this story, this uh, sequ sequence of facts makes more sense. That's why my client's not guilty rather than trying to, quote unquote, prove Alec Murdoch's innocence. All right. Well, clearly a lot more to talk about. So still ahead on Long Crime Daily, the Alec Murdoch murder trial may be nearing an end, but our coverage is far from over. We're taking a closer look and a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to break down what a forensics expert's testimony means for the case as he disputes what was determined at an autopsy. Everybody, our coverage of the Alec Murdoch double murder trial in South Carolina continues with more disagreement between experts. You see, earlier in the trial, Dr. Ellen Reamer testified about how Maggie and Paul died. She's the forensic pathologist who actually performed the autopsies on the victims. And she said that the shot that killed 22-year-old Paul came from below traveling upward. But the defense's expert disagrees. Okay, explain to the jury what she said and then what you believe, uh, and we'll talk about why the difference is in just a minute. Okay? Sure. So um, in her autopsy report, uh, she stated that she believed the entrance was coming from the left side, went up, and then it exited the top of the head. Um, to me, this is a contact range gun, uh, shotgun wound to the top of the head that caused extreme pressure build up in the head from it being contact leading to these types of fractures and that the pellets so the the shotgun wound comes in the um, wadding will start to open up all of that pressure basically for lack of a better term will explode um, what's there because the pressure needs to get out somehow and then the head would have been down like this, and the pellets lodged here and went into the left shoulder, and then you can see that the pellets are going down into the tissues of the left shoulder. So you believe the, um, the uh, wound that resulted in his head exploding was where? 
where where would the shotgun have been? Well, it would have been to the top back of his head. And how far away from the head? Oh, no, it would have been pressed against the head. So it would be a contact wound to the back of the head? Correct. To make a little bit more sense of this, on Law & Crime Network coverage of the trial on Monday, forensic death investigator Joseph Scott Morgan did a, demonstration, did a demonstration for us using shotgun shells. We're hearing a lot about shotguns and this sort of thing, and I just uh, I took time to kind of create this. I don't know if you guys can see it. This is actually a 12-gauge shotgun round that has been taken apart. Uh, this fires but, but I'm sorry, restart. This fires birdshot, this contained birdshot, very similar to the birdshot uh, that was used to kill Paul. Now, how this works is the anatomy of the shell, you've got the outer shell, okay? Once the firing is initiated by tapping the primer, the ignition of the powder down here takes place and it blows out. Remember, uh, Dr. Eisenstadt was talking about kind of the cylindrical shape of of the collected pellets inside the body. That means it didn't have time to deploy, Jesse that it stayed all in one configuration. As it deploys, a shot cup comes out. You see this, you keep hearing them use the term wadding. As wadding travels down range, these little leaflets on the side, they deploy, okay? And it, when you, if you look at any of these, you can see it in slow motion on, on uh, YouTube. These deployed, it's almost, it looks like a flower petal and it falls away. Didn't have time to fall away. That gives you a sense of how quick this happened. That means that the wadding traveled forward like this. The, the pellets, which are contained in here, were delivered through the wound and they stayed intact. Not completely intact, but you could still make out the fact that they were a collective. Shotguns are meant to spread. This round didn't have time to spread. That means mm -hmm. it was cl in close proximity. This goes back to the idea of shaving the hair. What Eisenstadt had said, and what's a good practice, is as this weapon initiates, a little flame comes out of the end. Remember, we're talking about gunpowder igniting, and it would have seared that outer skin. You'd even see it on the table, internal table of the skull. This was not done. Remember, uh, Reamer said the brain had been ejected out of the body. They didn't do an x-ray on the brain, Jesse. Right. So that's very important as well. You have to shave this area, see the soot deposition. You also collect the hair and look for any gunpowder on the hair. I don't know that that was done as well. Both sides have rested their cases in Alec Murdoch's murder trial in Walterboro, South Carolina. And last week's bombshell testimony from Murdoch himself has given the 12 panel jury a lot to think about. But what is also clear is that you, our viewers, have been coming to your own conclusions at home. We have the results from our daily YouTube poll, and here's Monday's consensus. Three days out from Murdoch's testimony, 65% of you think that Murdoch is guilty, 11% say he's not guilty, 18% think that there's going to be a hung jury, and 6% are still undecided. These results, pretty good indicator of opinions from outside the courtroom, but we also have eyes and ears inside the courtroom on a daily basis. Here's Law and Crime Zone and Jeanette Levy and Gigi McKelvey discussing what they've seen from the jury. I don't know what they were like on Friday. You were here on Friday. I remember you saying one of the jurors had a blanket over her head and some tissues in her ears. I saw the blanket juror today. She seemed engaged. Didn't look, really look that pleased to be here, but she was listening. They all seem like they're still listening. They're going back and forth with the, the tennis kind of head, the bob. Uh, they are listening. They are. It's, you know, it's just a different perspective of things that they've heard about over and over and over. You introduce the two persons uh, shooter theory, which I think the defense had to do just to get some reasonable doubt in there. They've been very attentive all day. I've kept a good eye for the most part on them. And yeah, so I think maybe they know we're in the home stretch too. So let's let's do our best and get all this in our head and go back and get this over. Well, given that, our last chat of the day is going to answer questions, not from me, nobody wants to hear from me, but from you at home. So we gathered some of the most asked about topics from today's YouTube stream to hopefully make a little thing, a little more sense to everybody. Tara, I'll start with you. This is a question from Caleb Mandrake out of South Carolina. This is all well, I should say. This is the question that he has. Are South Carolina jurors allowed to take notes 
or are they prohibited from doing so? And to make, take it a step further, how does it impact deliberations in the Murdoch trial? Good question, Caleb. Yes, they are allowed under South Carolina judicial procedures, but it's totally within the discretion of the judge. And as we know, Judge Newman here said there will be no note taking. And the rationale is, look, you listen to the evidence and you make sure you go by the evidence, not somebody else's right. notes. Brian, got a question from you from Brian Clevenger. Can Alec Murdoch be found guilty of just one murder or does the state have to prove he committed both murders? Well, great name, great question. I guess hypothetically speaking, they could do that. They can say guilty of killing Paul, but not Maggie or vice versa. But that would be interesting how they get to that conclusion. That would almost seem like they are crediting some of the testimony and evidence, but not others. And I don't know where they would be drawing the line. If we got a verdict like that, I'd expect an appeal. And they probably would do fairly well because it leads them to think, well, what did the jury really decide or how yeah. do they get to this conclusion based on the evidence? It, it would be an interesting verdict, but I don't see it happening. That's a really good question and it, I didn't even think of that. Imagine if that, act, that happened. I would love to hear the jurors' thoughts on that. Terry, Brian, thanks so much. Everyone out there, thanks for joining us here on Long Prime Daily. We're gonna see you next time as we discuss justice in America.